We're going to read God's Word now from the New Testament and from the first epistle of Peter. First Peter and chapter 1. And again, as I indicated on Wednesday night, I'm reading from the authorized, the King James Version of the Scriptures. First Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read into a few verses of chapter 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envings and all evil speakings, 
As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priest to do offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth in him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore who believe he is precious, but unto them who be disobedient the stone which the builder disallowed the same as made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them who stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Amen. And may God add his blessing and give to us understanding in that reading on holy and inspired word. For our meditation this morning, I want us to come back to the portion we read together there from 1 Peter and chapter 2 and verse 7. It will be the focus of our thoughts, but we will dwell upon the portion we read to expand and to fill our thoughts out. 1 Peter chapter 2, to you therefore who believe he is precious or he is honorable. When we come to this point, we can see that Peter is very logical in what he says because he's coming. He says, therefore, he's drawing a conclusion. He's done something and he's gathering it all together. And what he's gathering together is something that is sweet, precious to every believer. Those to whom he was writing and us who read it. Afterwards, he's concluding his arguments. He's been in these opening verses of this letter lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. He is setting something of the glory of the Lord before his readers then and now, talking about the person of Jesus Christ talking about the work that he's achieved and accomplished on behalf of his people. Speaking about the gifts that he has, he's obtained them at a fearful cost, but he makes them freely available to his people. We have a saying, the gospel is free, but it's not cheap. It costs the Lord to obtain the blessings that we presently experience. He sets before them and he sets before us the hope of the resurrection. He sets before them and he sets before us a great, confident, vibrant faith based upon the promises of God, on what God has said, on God's word. And all of it focuses time and time and time again upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us are old enough to remember Eamon Andrews. And he handed at the end of the program the red book to the client that was in front of him, the star, and he says, this is your life. That's what he's doing here with us here. He is gathering all of these thoughts together and he's, as it were, coming to a conclusion. He says, this is your Christ. This is your Savior. This is what he's done for you believers. And therefore, in verse 7, he's saying, to you who believe, if you are one of them, he is precious to you. In the light of all that he's done in his grace. 
in his mercy to those who are sinners. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. And therefore we value him. And it's always good just for a moment to stop. Yes, we look at who's right, what he's written here, but we ask ourselves the question, who is it that has written this for us? It's Peter that has written it. And again, just think of what Peter went through. Peter went through the bitterness of denial. But he also knew the bliss of forgiveness. The sorrow and the pain of denying. The disobedience, the the tears that would have been shed inwardly and outwardly by him as he denied his Lord. When you go back to Luke 22, verse 61, you find in all of the busyness of that night's transactions, their paths crossed. And very briefly, they caught eye, made eye contact one with the other. And the look that was exchanged before between them, it was a look of love and of passion. The Lord speaking with words, with a thought that words could never fully express or carry. Saying to Peter, despite all that you've done, I still love you. It was that look that broke Peter's heart. And so often it's a case with the Lord's people since. Yes, we can go astray. Yes, we can wander like sheep. We can go into the briars and the burn and the muck. We can go down into the gutter. And sometimes when we're there, we think of the Lord's chastisement and correction that's going to come upon us. Rightly so. And sometimes we can be a little bit apprehensive about what might be in store for us. But sometimes, not always, but sometimes, it's the way the Lord comes to us and he wins us back, not with the sword of justice raised against us, but with the embrace of love gathering us to him. That's what happened to Peter. And therefore we can see just how in that little phrase there is so, so much of his own experience, so, so much of the experience of a Christian, to you who believe, have you been through what Peter's been through? Perhaps we've all wondered, yes, it's not perhaps, we all have done it. We've all wandered at some time. We've all gone astray. Perhaps you have it on a monthly basis. What's happened in the last month since you've been here around the table of your Lord? Where have you been? What have you said? Where have you gone? That question can only be answered by you. And the only one that might be hearing it is the Lord. But you know what I'm talking about that Peter went through. You've wandered. You've strayed. And the Lord has perhaps sought you out and drawn you back. And this morning, you can sit beside Peter, sandals and robe and all, and you can say yes to you who believe. He is precious. You've had the particular memories of a vivid sin. You've been through something hard and difficult. But you can say he is precious. Go back again to my own favorites, the Psalms, Psalm 40. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. He's taken me from a fearful pit and from the miry clay. He's dragged you out of the habits of your own making and the cultivations that have gone on all your life up till now. And the Lord has dragged you out of that. 
And again you can say, He is precious. Well then, Peter wrote them, not only about his own experience, but gathering together the Christian's experience, gathering together yours and mine. What are we going to make of it this morning? What I want to do is to take three simple thoughts out of the portion that we've read together. Simple thoughts. Let me set them out now so that by the end, if I miss them, you'll tell me. First of all, he's precious because of what he has done for us. Precious because of what he is doing with us. And thirdly, precious because of what he will yet do for us. Back to the beginning. He is precious because of what he has done for us. Chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, verse 18, rather. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your conversation received by tradition from the Father. What has Jesus Christ done for every Christian believer? He has redeemed you. And if we unpack that word behind the word, there is the idea of the slavery of sin. There's the suffering of a life divorced from God and trying to eke out a significant life and satisfaction for ourselves in the light, in the darkness of our own making. There's the bad news that we could unpack about our own spiritual state and overlying that that could well be the work of the Lord in redeeming us and coming down to take us out of that midden, give us freedom and peace and pardon and forgiveness, to meditate on the rock and the pit from which we've been taken. And as we would do that, we could conclude, yes, he is precious because he has redeemed his people. But Peter is doing something much better for us. Peter is giving to you and to me, he's giving us a microscope. And he's making us look down, yes, you've been redeemed. But how? How have you been redeemed? And what he's doing is he's drawing our attention to the intrinsic worth of that sacrifice which made it all possible for us. You have been redeemed Not with gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish and without spot. So we pack, unpack it and we say, yes, what Christ has done, he has redeemed us. How has he redeemed us? He has redeemed us by himself and his own sacrifice. And there are two simple words I want us to linger on when we think of that. View down the microscope. First of all, there's no comparison. No comparison. It's not with gold and silver that you've been redeemed. What happens whenever there's an international crisis? What happens when there's some conflict, wherever it might be in the world, right over on the other side of the world? What happens? You immediately find the price of gold goes up. It is the bolt hole for anybody who's got anything. It's the one thing that is a valuable commodity that all people value and want to have. Gold. The precious things, the most precious thing the world sets any store on. And yet we're told here that even the most precious things even the most valuable of things, they just simply don't even come close to obtaining what you and I need, pardon and forgiveness. Salvation, quite simply, cannot be bought. It's beyond price and it is beyond purpose. It is beyond purchase. It's in a class apart Unique. And how is it unique? It is unique because of the person. 
It is unique because of his death. It is unique because of the power of his blood shed at his death. We cannot earn it. If we were to gather together, not just simply gold, but silver, the pictures, the portraits, all of these valuable commodities that men, so, met, that men set so much store on, if we were to gather all that together, it still would not purchase pardon and forgiveness for you or for me. Left to ourselves, we have no hope. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and you read that chapter, you'll find that Paul is painting a black picture and some people looking over their shoulder might say, well, you're awfully down and doer and foreboding, you Christians. But we've got to look at life in the raw and we've got to look at life as it really is. And that's what Paul is doing there and he spares no punches in describing us exactly as we are, 1st century or 21st century. And he tells us the picture applies to me and to you and he says, this is what you're like. Dead in trespasses and sin. And he goes through it and he spares no blows. But then he comes to just a little pivot. One little word and he says, but God. And the whole picture changes. We left to ourselves could not possibly obtain forgiveness or salvation. But God has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. It is his gift given to us, never earned, never reached. I want to... This will show my age... I want to use an illustration. A long, long time ago, when many of us might have been in primary school, come to the Christmas season and you'd come down the street to the high street and you'd run along to a toy shop and you'd crush your nose against the glass and you're looking there at, oh, perhaps it was a rifle or something that was great and you... You spent five, ten minutes every day after school just pressing your nose against the glass and you walked away so slowly because you couldn't afford it and you kept it in your memory and you went home and you repeated the process the next day and the next day, always looking in that window. And then one day you come down the street to the high street and you run across to the shop and you look in and it's gone. You go home sad. You're dragging your feet. And you discover that there it is. A gift. Given to you. All of the longing. All of the yearning. All of the sadness that you had. Suddenly passes and fades away. As you enjoy and as you appreciate that gift that you've been given. Multiply that up into spiritual terms then and you find exactly what Peter is speaking about here. That gift. We could never get it ourselves but God in his grace has given it and therefore this passage applies to you who believe. He is precious because of what he has done. He has redeemed you and there is nothing in comparison to what gift he has obtained and how he's obtained it. But that's only half of what Peter is saying. He says not only is there no comparison, he's also saying there is no corruption. He is saying there, you have been redeemed as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. There is no flaw and there is no stain whatsoever in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his life, and everything that he did. There is nothing that man could lay hold of. There is nothing that the devil could drag up and present him with, try as he could and did. The Lord Jesus Christ was perfect in everything that he did, in obedience to the perfect demanding righteousness of God his Father. His life 
was absolutely spotless. And yet he died. He poured out his blood. And again, we've got to follow the microscope and focus upon the value of that blood and of that sacrifice. Because there is a mystery there. A mystery that was shrouded in darkness for three hours. No spectators. A transaction between God the Father and God the Son on behalf of his people. There is a mystery there in Calvary. On the one hand, Jesus Christ is coming into the closest possible identification with his people. He is there acting as the substitute for his own. He puts you aside and he says, I'll attend to this. I will attend to this. That's the closest possible identifying he has with his people. Their substitute, their stand-in. But right on the other side... We see the mystery because not only is he the closest possible in his identifying with us, we also find that he's as far from us, so far from us, the greatest distance possible because we are sinners and he is spotless. And so we see the value of that blood poured out on behalf of his people. Blood that we're going to see in a moment in the representation, in the glasses, in the cup, whichever form you do it. It's the blood and the symbolism that matters and is significant. Willingly given. Lovingly given for his people. Let me go back to the child and pressing the glass, the nose against the glass. Disappointment comes, goes home, and he gets the gift. But that gift is much more precious to the child when the child is told and begins to realize what it cost his or her parents, what they had to do without, what they went through simply to get that gift for their little child. That gift is much more precious when we realize the cost of getting it. Again, multiply it up onto the spiritual domain. When you realize the cost to the Lord Jesus Christ of the privileges you and I have, as the Lord opens the scriptures and multiplies them to us, either something fresh or something new or something old that comes to us time and time again. But the enormity of what the Lord went through simply to make these privileges available to us, again we can say, to you who believe, he is precious. So yes, There we have it, what Christ has done. But I'm not going to stop there, because there's a third thought, very briefly I want to bring out, and it's proper that we do so. Not only the no comparison, not only no corruption, the third thing we have here is commitment. Because listen to what verse 16 says. It is written, Be ye holy, as I am holy. That's the commitment that Peter is setting before them, and what is the argument that he gives, the very argument that we've been unpacking just now, because of the way you've been redeemed and the cost of your redemption, therefore, this is the kind of life you've got to live. No ifs or buts, no pick and mix, it's everything and always. That's what the Lord requires of you and me, that we be holy, that we be like him. Not only that we be that way here in the service in the church, but tomorrow in our dealings with others and the way we behave on Monday and Tuesday and other days of the week. We are to walk worthy of the one who has done so much 
for us. I want to come just to one passage which, when you quote it without telling where it comes from, people are quite surprised when you eventually discover where it is. I want to read it. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charges and his statutes and his judgment and his commandments always. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children who have not known and who have not seen uh, the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. There the writer is saying, love the Lord, and I'm not speaking to a second generation people of Christians. I'm talking to those who've known it, the mighty hand and the stretched out arm of the Lord. Therefore, it brings an obligation upon you, a responsibility with the privilege. And where does it come from? Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1. A way back there. That's what the Lord requires of us. And the foundation, the love of the Lord to us. Deuteronomy 7, backed up to, verse 11, to chapter 11. Let me continue quickly. Not only what Christ has done, we have been redeemed. But the second thing I indicated is, what is Christ doing now? Chapter 2, verse 5. You also as living stones are built up a spiritual house. The Lord Jesus Christ is enthroned in glory at the right hand of God the Father, fulfilling the plans and purposes of all eternity. And what is he doing? He is building his church. And what is he using to build his church? He is building it with living stones. He's the foundation, and the foundation gives shape, size, strength, And on that foundation, he brings in living stones. He's the source of spiritual life. And he gathers his people to himself. Because who are the living stones? You and me. He has been at work in your life and your testimony. He's been at life. He's been at work in your life all through the years. I know not what that might be. But you can tell. The ways in which the Lord has put his hand upon you time and time again. The different texts that he's spoken to you of. The way in which perhaps something dramatic, surprising has broken into your life to focus you. There's a whole range of different testimonies the Lord has, but they've all been with the same purpose and to the same intent and end to draw you into his church. Where we now are, not in the building, primarily but we are all together in his church, a living set of stones. We've known him. He heals the brokenhearted. He gives relief to those who are weary. Pardon to those who are guilty. Purity to those who are unclean. There is beauty that he bestows on those who are disfigured. We have been on a voyage of discovery to discover not only the Lord, but before that, to discover ourselves. And when we've discovered ourselves, it's not been a pretty sight. But the Lord has taken us by the hand, and he's brought us to the foot of the cross. And there he has taken away the scales from our eyes, and he's shown to us the beauty of the Lord. Once he was a root out of dry ground, there was nothing attractive in the Lord to us until that day when he touched our eyes and we saw him for ourselves. He's given us a new heart. He's given us a joy. He's given us a purpose in living. Life takes on an altogether different complexion from that moment, from that time, from that great crucial experience when we saw him for ourselves. We are therefore in his church, living stones. How he's dealt with us from that moment until now 
Oh yes, his patience. The way in which he's dealt with us in the face of all our inconsistencies and provocations. And the longer that we go on, the more that we've got to speak in these things. The psalmist, Psalm 25 or 27, speaks about forgiving the sins of his youth. These are the ones that come back vividly to us at this stage in our lives. The things of our youth. And we look back at the patience and the wonderful loving kindness of God. And we're simply lost for words. What is my house? David said it to the Lord. What is my house, Lord, that you should think of me? And we can say it today. What has he done to your life? He's brought you into his building. He's brought you into the church. Not only building his church, but the second thought quickly, he's binding us together. He's binding us together in his church. Christians are united because they have the Lord as their Savior. It's not a denomination. It's not doctrine. It's not the form of worship. These things, important as they might be in their place, these are not the things which tie us together. What ties us together is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told here, the one quality that he sets out, you are a living stone that built up a spiritual life, a holy priesthood. Again, that quality coming out of the purity that the Lord looks for, expects, and demands of us as his people in his church. Holiness, the Holy Bible, look at the back spine of your Bible. The word holy there means set aside and set apart. That's what it means, and that's what it requires. The Lord requires of us. We are set aside and apart for him and his use. He has absolute claims upon you and I. Every one of us, perhaps we've all at one time had great expectations, ideas, and dreams. Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be that. And the Lord has intervened and says, oh, no, you don't. This is what I want you to be. This is what I'm going to have you to make. This is where you're going to work. And sometimes it takes us a long, long time to get used to that idea. Sometimes it takes us years to accept the overriding of heaven's wisdom in our lives. But the moment we embrace it, the moment we have satisfaction, his use His use, wherever that might be, as he opens doors for us. We might rebel, we might object from time to time. But there is a tremendous privilege of being in his church, of being bound together with his people. Simply put, his eye is upon us. You go down the streets of Swansea, Edinburgh, London. And you're there in a crowd. Who notices you? You're mixed with so many people. But the Bible tells us that the eye of the Lord is on the way of his people. His ear is open to the cry. And his hand is about them to protect them. That's what the Lord is doing. He's gathering his people together. He's maturing us. He is molding us. He is changing us. He's bringing us more and more like to the character of his own son. That's what he's doing. Sanctifying us and using us. And therefore we can say, he is precious. Let me use an illustration like this. Psalm 92 speaks of it being transplanted in the grace of God into the courts of God's house. And I will ask the question, therefore, this morning, where are you? Where are you this morning in God's grace? Now, 
Go out to the road there and have a look at the front of the church. And you'll see there the symbol of when it was built. You'll see all the decorative coins down the corner. You'll see all the stones round the windows, round the doors. Everything that is there in the public eye. And it's great. But down there, there's another stone. And this building would not be complete without that one stone. So, you see, there are those who are in the public eye in the work of the church. Your minister, the office bearers, and such like. But there are others. Perhaps you're on your own, and you're alone, but you're a Christian. You're like that stone down there. This building would not be complete without your presence, your prayers. You've been here at worship and in church. So the question is, sometimes we, we put ourselves down. Sometimes we put others up. But we've got to take not the adjustment and the judgment of men. We've got to take the assessment of God. What is he doing to you and with you? He's building his church. And he's taking you in as living stones into that construction. And therefore, if you're there, fulfilling whatever purpose it might be, there or there, then you can say, I am where I am. I'm doing what I'm doing because of God's intervention. I'm doing it for his glory. And I'm doing it because he has put his hand upon me and called me and given me this to do. What Christ has done, what Christ is doing. Thirdly, what he will yet do. Chapter 1, verse 4. Blessed be the God and Father who, according to his abundant mercy, hath given us a lively hope to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. You put a name on it. Your name's on it. And he's preparing you to go and collect that good. He is there having an inheritance for every one individually of his people. What do we have? We have a lively hope. We're facing the future. If you're Christian this morning, we're facing the future. And we face it not with speculation or hopes and maybe, perhaps it's possible. These are not the words we use to describe our hope. We have a living hope built upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done himself and what he's promised to his people. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. His resurrection is a model and a pattern for our resurrection when we will be raised victorious over death and pure from sin and we will be with the Lord. That's what he's promised. That's the inheritance that is there spoken of and set out for his people. The place prepared. But I want to come down. Peter gives us the microscope every time. And it's important that we follow him in the words that he uses. Look at what he says. You have an inheritance. Yes, what is it though? It's an inheritance that's incorruptible. We all know what rust does. What thieves do. And what moths do. In their own way and by their own means. They corrupt and they spoil. But what Peter is saying here is that in this inheritance before God's people, there is no destructive forces at all, at all, at all in operation. There is nothing that is going to spoil day after day, year in, year out, constantly unfolding for us. It is incorruptible. We're told it's undefiled. Undefiled, it's taken in the the moral stains. Let me quote one passage from memory. Revelation chapter 21. 
verse 4 speaks about God wiping away every tear. What does that mean? What does it signify? Surely it means this. There are things that spoil us in our Christian experience here in this world. There are times when we've got blessed company with the Lord and then something comes in and spoils it and we're sad because it has been spoiled. And what the Lord is saying there is this inheritance that is in store for God's people, it is unstained. There is going to be nothing to spoil ever ever, ever, the enjoyment of spiritual things in the company of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says he's going to wipe away anything that would bring these tears to the eyes of the saints. Incorruptible. Unstained. Thirdly, we're told that fades not away. It will not decay with time. It will not grow stale. It will not wither in delight. Let's go back to that boy who got the gift out of the shop at Christmas time. Years go by. No, just months go by. You come to Easter time and you go into the bedroom of the boy and you ask, hey, where's, where's, where's that gift you got? And it's underneath the bed and it's broken or it's at the back of the wardrobe and it's no longer the delight and he's moved on to other things. That won't happen with the enjoyment of this inheritance the Lord has prepared for his people and to which he's calling them and taking them. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is the treasure that awaits his people. The sheer joy, the blessing that we have around his word, around his table just now. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14 speaks about the earnest of the Spirit. And what it means is just simply a little sampler. A little sampler. That's what we have from time to time just now. These little experiences that come to God's people when we're... It's as if time goes away from us. And we're there alone with the Lord and his word. And something sweet comes upon our soul. And we're just simply lost for these moments to enjoy that gift that he brings to us. That is an example, no, a sample, a taste, a foretaste of the fullness that is yet to come. The earnest of the spirit, a little sampler. That's what the Lord is speaking about in Ephesians 1. That's what Peter is speaking about here in Peter. He is speaking about something that is not going to fade away. It's not going to go stale and it's not going to wither. It's not going to lose its sparkle or its appeal. It's going to be fresh every single morning, every single moment to his people. That's what he's going to do for his people then. Is he? precious to you as you think of things yet to come? Do you entertain that hope? Is he the focus of your expectation? Right down to the wire, is the Lord Jesus Christ the desire of your heart now? And later, do you long to be with him more than with anyone or anything else? Yes, you can say, he is precious. We're all growing old. As I grow old, so things begin to take a sharper focus. And with this, I'm finishing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is giving to us a very important principle that we can apply as we grow old. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, our inward man is renewed day by day. We all know what it is for the hair to grow, oh, grey or fall out, the hearing to go, the teeth to go, the joints to buckle underneath us. We all know these processes in some way coming upon us. Our outward man perishing. But there is a compensation that Paul is speaking about here. And there's a compensation that only the Christian has. Our outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. 
the glory of Emmanuel's land comes brighter in our vision, in our hopes, in our expectations. There was a man, Hess, who was martyred at Constance way back in the beginning years of the church. And he wrote these words. Our inheritance will never lose anything through age or sickness on our part or through any damage to itself. And it will never lessen in delight because we have enjoyed it so long. Our inheritance will never lose anything through age or sickness on our part or through any damage to itself. And it will never lessen in delight because we've enjoyed it so long. To you who believe, he is precious. Let us pray. Our Lord and our gracious God, thy word indeed is sweet to the taste in the soul of thy people. We thank thee, Lord, for the way in which we can sit underneath its ministry and the way it addresses us with our experiences, with our characters, with our memories. And we pray, Lord, that thy word indeed might be broken down to each one of us, that we might take some crumb, some handful of truth, that we might take something to our souls this morning and go in the strength of these things yet many days. May thy blessing be upon thy truth and upon us thy people. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.